When most people think of the holidays or the fall season, they think good food, trees shedding their leaves, chilling with the family, and that's nice and all. But uh, the real ones know that this time is specially reserved for locking yourself inside your room with your cat and watching cartoons about talking horses and awkward teenagers. I was socially studied as a kid. Over the Garden Wall is a series that needs no introduction. If you haven't watched it, I'm not here to give you a recap, pal. Buy that Hulu subscription and get busy right now. The whole series is about an hour and 50 minutes, so if you've got time for this video, you've got time to watch literally the best animated show of all time. Of all time! Blazing aside, if you can't tell, I kind of like this show. And I've wanted to make a video about it for a while, but I've been struggling to find a new and interesting way to cover it that would, one, entertain y'all, and also appear to the YouTube algorithm because um our artistic integrity yay Woo! So, in today's video, I'm going to enact a completely original video idea that no one has ever done on any cartoon series whatsoever and rank every episode of Over the Garden Wall from worst to best. Even though there's only like 10 episodes and falls already com completely over. And just so I beat you to it, yes, I'm aware there are longer, more ambitious videos made with the same trend in mind. And I may just be a lowly bottom feeder in the YouTube paradigm, but uh, suck a fart and chew it. I like making these videos and i was i was gonna rewatch the series this week anyway so i mean like it's free content Just, why why are you why are you why are you complaining anyways one last thing i want to say before i get into the rankings is that uh i want to say i like all these episodes and i think they all have their own purpose in the bigger picture and add something cool and unique to the series and the rankings that i'm gonna give them are all just compared to each other and literally nothing else it's gonna be like ranking your favorite world peace leaders i could say mother Teresa is better than MLK, but at the end of the day, they're both pretty objectively good good people. Please don't decapitate me in the comments. Anyways, let's get started off with the first episode, The Old Grist Mill, or as I like to call it, the Worst Episode. Okay, okay. The Old Grist Mill isn't the worst episode of Over the Garden Wall from what I've researched online, but it definitely isn't mine or anyone else's favorite from what I've seen online. It's not a bad episode by any means, but it definitely feels short and minuscule for a pilot for the show. All these episodes are 10 minutes, sure, but for some reason this particular one feels especially 10 minutes to me. I appreciate that it doesn't drag on, but also, damn it, I want more time with these characters. Mainly Greg. The main plot of it is a good introduction to the series for what it is. In the the opening is very beautifully animated and foreshadowy and just, I don't know, over the garden wally. It, it's, it's great. I can't get enough of it. But the actual content of the episode isn't too crazy. We kind of just open with both of our boys lost in the woods until they meet Doc Brown yelling old man jargon and follow him back to his shack. Little jokes and dialogue between the brothers is hilarious. And this strange bloodborne wolf fight is really well done. But in comparison to the rest of the episodes, there are cooler fights to be had, deeper conversations, and uh, funnier, wackier Greg moments to be had. Though the candy pants bit is pretty goddamn funny. Stakes aren't exactly set just yet, besides a slight mention of a beast in the woods. But it still is pretty entertaining. Though one thing I wish the series had gotten to do is give us viewers a bit more context going into the series. A little voiceover explaining the unknown in the beginning is cool and all. But like, the way we just kind of jump into the episode with no explanation is a bit strange. No doubt, it worked for what it was. But, I don't know, just just a thought. Overall, I give it a, um, here, how the, how the fuck am I gonna, <laughs> how am I gonna rank these again? <laughs> I'll just say it's like my ninth favorite episode. I... <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably a good system. Anyways, um, next episode. Yay! What I will say about Hard Times at the Huskin' Bee is that it's a much more entertaining premise of an episode than the previous one. The setup for Wirt trying to find his way out of the woods through a ghost town while also bantering with a talking bluebird and accidentally pissing off a bunch of scary-ass pumpkin zombie people is kinda hilarious. The dialogue is just pure gold as well. Do you like waffles? No, waffles make me sick. I eat... maggots. Ah! What? How can you not eat waffles? Ah! What? I stepped on a pumpkin! There's also a lot of weird, eerie shots in this episode that I think are really cool. One, for example, is when Wirt is looking around town for civilians and ends up just seeing a turkey sitting at a dining table alone in an abandoned house. It's just kind of this weird, isolated thing that feels very off-putting and strange, but so uniquely over the garden wall. Another thing I love about this episode is the reveal that the pumpkins actually aren't malicious and don't want to hurt the boys, but are rather just resurrecting the dead and chilling. Also, that when Wirt declares 
declines the pumpkin's offer for him to stay in their town Pottsfield after doing copious amounts of child labor, mind you. The Grand Pumpkin Man just replies, Oh, well, you'll join us someday. This episode encapsulates pretty much everything that I love about the series. The childlike goofiness, the mystique and uncanniness of the creatures inhabiting the unknown, and of course, only the best music known to mankind. It sets up some nice dynamics between our main characters and establishes where the group is heading for the next few episodes. This one gets the, the third, third spot on my list. Yay, you woo 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 woo. Next up, we have Schooltown Follies, arguably the most wholesome episode of the whole series. It features Wirt and Greg stumbling upon a school for farm animals, which by itself is just kind of adorable. But it also manages to be hilarious with this weird argument that goes on between Beatrice and Wirt, where Wirt stubbornly tries to prove Beatrice right that he's a pushover with no brain by following every order he's given for the good part of like a day. There's also this weird subplot about a gorilla being on the loose and how it's actually a teacher's deadbeat lover trapped in a gorilla costume. The accents are ridiculous. The drama is over the top. The music is grand. You can't help but at least chuckle at everything going on. Greg also has a lot of cute moments in this episode, particularly the potatoes and molasses song he does to try and cheer up the school farm animals. Everybody has their own little part to play in this episode. And on a first watch, it's definitely a memorable one. At least to me, that is. So uh, for now, I'm gonna put this at number seven. And before you take offense to that, just try to keep in mind that this ranking should really prove how good the series is, that this episode is in the lower section of the list. Anyways, moving on, we got... Songs of the Dark Lantern is kind of a nice resting point for the show. We just came off the high of Greg's cute little charity concert. Now it's pouring rain in the woods and our main protagonists are stuck in the back of a hay bale carriage with a screaming lunatic driving them to God knows where. Which then brings us to a creepy tavern where the gang decides to, again, ask for directions. And uh, hilarity ensues. We meet a fucking stupid cast of characters that just absolutely ignore Wirt's plead for directions and instead just sing for him. We're trying to get to... I'm the highwayman. Okay, good to know. Well, so you see... The highwayman is definitely a highlight for me. <laughs> Whenever I think of the series, the image of that Santa gnome-looking motherfucker always pops into my brain for some reason. So, that's a plus, I guess. I also love the sheer amount of songs in this episode. Little Beast Him at the end is, uh, it's pretty head-bopping. It's a banger. It's a lot of cool lyrical symbolism and foreshadowing about the beast. And all the voice actors kind of kill it. Also, I, I, I can't get it up in the sea, like, like, what? What the fuck is he doing? <laughs> also, the little bit with the woodsman near the end where Wirt mistakes him for the beast and ends up burning down an Adelwood tree is a really cool shot, and uh, I, I don't know, I thought it'd be worth mentioning. And with that, I put it at number six. Overall, <laughs> love this episode, but uh, love the next episode a little bit more. According to a lot of the episode rankings that I see online, Mad Love is deemed one of the least favorites by the general over the Garden Wall community. And I'm just gonna, uh, completely disregard that opinion. Because this is one of my absolute favorites of the series. Well, I mean, if you count right in the middle as one of your absolute favorites in the series. But regardless, this episode is kinda wacky and goofy. It does not take place in the middle of the woods like most of the episodes do, but rather in a gigantic mansion owned by a tea company's CEO, who also happens to, uh, maybe be a little crazy. And the reason they're in there? To steal the fucking rob him for all he's worth to eat the garden. Oh. They they just wanted two cents for the fairy. That's not that bad at all. I'd steal two cents in a heartbeat. The whole episode is basically just Wirt and Greg trying to convince this old dude that Wirt and Greg are his nephews long enough so that way they can just find pocket change around the house. They split up for a bit, and Wirt and Beatrice have a nice conversation that delves into each other's histories as characters. It's revealed that Beatrice wasn't always a bird, and sort of accidentally cursed her family for a dozen generations to be bluebirds. They seem to get closer by the end of the episode, and it's a nice little character development from a uh, constantly bickering and never getting along. Meanwhile, Greg, a horse, and Jeff Bezos search for a ghost that Jeff apparently saw one night in his giant manor. Let me make one thing clear. A ghost isn't completely out of the realm for Over the Garden Wall's Americana folklore-esque vibe. But in the context of this episode, uh, it's very much implied that this dude is uh, fucking insane. Do you know what I did for this money? The, the things these filthy hands have done 
to make this money. And when they finally get to the room where the dude initially fainted from seeing the ghost, the horse of all people finally snaps and accuses him of being insane and also a murderer. But in the end, the ghost turns out to be real and it is revealed that she is no other than Jeff Bezos' tea business competitor. And that the mansion the whole episode has been taking place in is actually not just Jeff Bezos' mansion, but actually the other person's mansion. Just like, what am I doing with my hand? Like weirdly combined. And then they just kind of start making out after realizing. So... It's a little weird. But overall, it's a pretty cute episode. Wirt and Greg end up getting the two cents they need without committing armed robbery. A lovely couple comprised of billionaires is born. And the horse decides to go on his redemption arc and become a tea horse for one of the tea companies. So there's, there's that. Also, Greg gets blackpilled and throws away all the money at the end of the episode. Five out of ten. Lullaby in Frogland is exactly what it sounds like. There's a lot of songs, a lot of frogs, and, well, I guess not a lot of land. But for the most part, this episode always has some kind of bit going on, and it's an absolute joy to experience on all of my rewatches. The basic rundown of the episode is that our gang somehow, uh, snuck onto the frog ferry without paying the two cents that Greg threw away. And to avoid getting caught, they do a three kids in a trench coat maneuver and try to disguise themselves with a the boat's band. Also, not to mention, it features literally the best song in the entire show which I can't play for copyright reasons, but uh, please just uh, load up Spotify and listen to it if you haven't heard it in a while. So pretty, so nice. And they say the name of the show in it. They they say they say the line. They, uh, it's not super complicated. There's not much conflict outside of the twist of the end. And every time I rewatch it, I get this nice comfy feeling in my stomach that everything is cool. And maybe the world is cool. And maybe art is cool. And that, uh, yeah, good, good episode. Though Beatrice does end up betraying both the boys at the end of the episode and it kind of sets off this depression in work. It sucks, and you can see Beatrice really regret her actions in trying to trick the boys into being wool-headed servants, but hey, it happens, okay? I'd forgive her personally. This one gets the fourth spot. All right, little bro. I'm not gonna hold you. I'm not gonna glizzy gobble either. This episode on rewatch is kind of just okay. I'm sure there's some 40 chess Dante's Inferno Watergate type metaphor going on, but just as an average watcher, I'm feeling a slight me, 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 me. compared to the rest of the episodes. So I guess, uh, here's a quick recap. After effectively cutting ties with Beatrice, Swert and Greg just kind of stumble into a cabin and find an alarmingly pale girl who's just doing some chores. Then, out of nowhere, the fucking greedy pipe man shows up and controls the girl's thoughts with a bell and threatens to eat anyone who's not supposed to be in the house. Then, uh, once the pipe man goes upstairs to lay down and nap, Wirt comes out of hiding and convinces the girl to run away with her, being the absolute riz god that Wirt is. And when the greedy pi- I'm not, I'm not fucking, I'm not doing this bit anymore. When Auntie Whispers eventually wakes up and realizes Wirt's plot to run away with, uh, I, I guess her, her niece, she tries to warn them all to leave immediately. But, uh, kinda ends up failing as the girl turns into this spooky, scary ghost that wants to, uh, feed on Wirt and Greg. It's a pretty cool twist. But one, one thing I find, uh, kinda lame in this episode is that, uh, Greg's frog just conveniently has the bell in his stomach and they kinda just ring it and, like, wish the spirit to go away, which feels just just like very weirdly convenient. Like you don't think Auntie Whispers would have done that earlier if she knew that she could do that? Whatever. It's it's an 11 minute episode. It's like that's the one kind of ish plot hole I can find in this whole series. So it's not like it's even that big of a deal. But whatever. I thought it was worth mentioning. This episode doesn't really add too much to the overarching plot besides work getting more susceptible to the beast's oily hands by the end of the episode. It's just not as memorable of an episode as the others, in my personal opinion. I do think the whole burgling hurts bit is pretty funny, and I quote the ringing of the bell commands you all the time with my friends. Again, not bad, it's just not an episode that I gravitate to as much as the others in comparison. But with that being said, I'm putting this at the 8th spot. Moving on. Now, I may get some slack for this opinion, but I think that Babes in the Woods, compared to the rest of this really good show, it's kind of just a nothing episode. Despite my favorite character being Greg, a whole episode inside of his mind, or I guess Cloud City as he calls it, is a lot less appealing than you'd think. It does have some normal screen time in the beginning, with us seeing Wirt at his lowest point. He sort of gives up on their mission to go find their home and go to sleep, leaving Greg to be silly and, uh, 
I don't know, like fart around in his dreams. But definitively, it is one of the most arbitrary and kind of just pointless episodes of the whole series. It does have a point to the show, and I understand why it's here. But on rewatches, it's not exactly something that I look forward to seeing. It is undeniably the cutest episode, though. And a lot of the creators work on Adventure Time shows through a lot of the silly animations, and uh, it sets up the penultimate stakes for the final episode and makes for a really good cliffhanger looking back on it. But that really doesn't excuse the eight minutes of waffling the show does to stretch its runtime. Overall, to wrap up my thoughts on this episode, Jenna Ortega's in this episode, bottom of the list it goes. Okay, I know how I just went on a tangent about how Babes in the Woods sucked because it deviated a lot from the over the garden wall formula, but uh, I'm gonna do a complete 180 here and try to tell you why I think this other episode that deviates from the normal formula is one of the best, if not the best in the series. Into the Unknown, If You've Forgotten, is a prequel episode that sort of explains how Wirt and Greg got lost in the unknown in the first place. It's a teen drama piece that doesn't have anything super supernatural in it, but rather details the story of a crush that Wirt has mentioned in previous previous episodes, but hasn't been fully fleshed out besides, you know, his ramblings against some dude named Jason Funderburker. What a douchey name, by the way. I completely get his anger. But what's funnier, though, is that when we actually meet Jason Funderburker, he's the nerdiest, scrawniest, puniest little guy. Like, Wirt has absolutely nothing to be scared of. Yet he overthinks literally everything. Everyone is so nice to him. They invite him to things, they try talking with him, yet he still sees himself as this loner, loser outcast. It's kind of hilarious and gives us an insight into who he truly is in comparison to Greg. And before he gives up completely on trying to woo his high school crush, just like how he gives up trying to find his way out of the unknown in episode 8, he still blames Greg both times despite sabotaging himself. He's flawed, and we realize that this is just the mentality he has towards life in general because of this episode. This episode is also a great addition to the series in that it covers all aspects of fall. Halloween, costumes, candy, dumb parties. What we got before was all just this folklore Americana backdrop. But now, with Into the Unknown, this series celebrates all aspects of fall, even the modern bits, which I think is pretty cool. And another thing I should probably mention about this episode is that the way the boys get trapped into the unknown is purposefully left ambiguous, presumably transporting them into, like, a, a dream-like state. On the other hand, though, it could have just been some sort of limbo for wayward souls that died in different time periods of America. Notice, uh, Wirt leaning over Quincy Endicott's grave, the, the crazy tea guy in, in this episode. Bet you didn't notice that on your first watch. Bet you didn't notice that. Is this stream theory chat? <laughs> So, uh, um, one last thing I want to mention before we move on to the finale is that there's a short flash forward near the end of the episode where Wirt meets Beatrice's family as birds and they, they like, they spoon feed him dirt. Anyways, that's about all I gotta say about the episode. Um, might be a little controversial, but first place, fuck you. Maybe I'm a sucker for a good ending. Maybe I just love child abuse. The unknown out of every episode here is the most climactic and important for everyone's characters. Greg agrees to take Wirt's place and claim to the beast. And once Wirt realizes Greg is in danger, he heads out into the blistering cold to save his brother from certain doom. And when the time does arrive to save him, Wirt overcomes his cowardice and defeatist attitudes and exposes the beast's lies to everyone, helping the woodsman let go of his fear of the beast as well. Even Greg, the silliest Billy you've ever seen, gains some maturity, and owns up to stealing his infamous Rock Facts Rock from Lady Daniel's garage. Also, Beatrice shows up again and gains some redemption from her earlier betrayal in the series. It's just a great finale all around. I love all the tense moments between characters and the look in the woodsman's eyes once he realizes how long the beast has been lying to him, and that he maybe could have saved his daughter the way Wirt saved his brother. I also love the absolutely mortifying glimpse we get at what the beast is supposed to look like. It's nightmare fuel. It's moody. It's gritty. It's charming. It is over the garden wall to a T. And when all the conflict is resolved and the boys wake up in a hospital, Wirt finally has the courage to ask his crush out to hang out with him. Of course, he's still a bit nervous and a little bit of a pussy, but he's no longer blaming anyone else for how his life is. He doesn't make excuses for himself. And he pursues what he wants. It's powerful shit. And uh, being someone who has been told they're very work coded in real life, it gives me hope that possibly one day I won't be. But why the hell does Greg's frog still have the bell in his stomach. What, what was all was all this real? What have have I been lied to? You can't you can't just end the episode. I lied. The episode doesn't end there. We actually get a really pretty outro that gives us some closure on some major B plots from the series. The woodsman finally gets reunited with his daughter once the beast is gone. Beatrice turns her family back into humans, and Greg gives back the rock facts rock just like he said he would. Oh my God! This show is pink. Oh, fucking.
and shit. Anyways, to wrap this thing up, here's the final list. I doubt these rankings will change anytime soon, but just in case I got it wrong, be sure to tell me how much of a dipshit I am in the comments, and hopefully we won't start World War III. I'm glad I got to talk about this show on my channel, even if it's just for a dumb, uh, slop video. I watch this thing practically every year, and I don't know, it's nice to bring some of the cool vibes it brings to my life with some strangers on the internet, even though it's, uh, <laughs> it's not fall, and the topic's dead, and no one, and no one's gonna fucking watch it. Every season is a little bit late in Texas anyways, so I mean, like, it, technically in my mind, I'm on time. Subscribe if you like this video, and I'll try to get something a little less sloppy out sometime in the future. Also watch these other cartoon-related videos I have. They're mostly all Fiona and Cake, but, um, there may be, may be more by the time you're watching this. I don't know. Bye!